Good evening. Good evening. Yeah, that's amazing. Ryan said he wasn't going to make it through those songs, and he still led songs better than I would. Yeah, he was just got off of a little bit of a cold, so he's been struggling a little bit, but he did pretty good. I thought. Yeah. This good evening, evening, what I would like to see, I, I should be having slides this evening. We'll see if they show up here. Uh, this evening, what I want to talk about is uh, the idea of some of the requirements, some of the things that Jesus expects from us as Christians, some of the things that we should have in our lives so that we know we're living up to the gospel. You know, in that Great Commission, Jesus wanted his apostles to make disciples. You know, that was the, the last physical words that we heard of Jesus on this earth was that Great Commission. It was before he ascended into heaven. He wanted his disciples to go and, and make disciples all over the world. He wanted them to preach the gospel, teaching to baptize those that believed in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You know, what is a disciple? Uh, a disciple is a learner, a follower, someone who adheres to the teaching of someone. You know, Jesus wants us to uh, learn from him. He wants us to, to realize, Matthew 11, 28 through 30, Come to me, all of you who are labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So we, we come to the idea throughout reading the scriptures, what does Jesus expect from me? What does he want me to do? And, and obviously, the, the three things that we're going to talk about this evening are, are not the only three things. It's just a generalization of things that we need to look in our lives to make sure that we have. You know, being a disciple it involves many things, but especially that we love. 2 Peter 1, 5 through 8 says this, it says, but also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to your virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. For if these things are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Right there alone is a list of things that we see, and I've preached sermons on 2 Peter 1 before, about all of those virtues that we can add to our lives. You know, to me it's amazing how, you know, God doesn't have us flying around blind, wondering what our next move should be, what we should do next. But in actuality, he even gives us lists of things that we can work on. You know, this being one over in Galatians, the, the fruit of the Spirit, you know, is another one where we, we see these things. We can actually take the list, you know, it's kind of like a, you know, maybe like a pros and a cons list today. We can put up a list and say, do I have this attribute? Do I have this character? I guess a, another question that might come out of that is if we are to love, what is it or who is it? that we are to love. How can we best show our, our love to the world, to the church? Now when we look at these three things, the first one is defining love. You know, first off, we need to love the Lord. You know, why would you want to be His disciple? Why would you want to follow Him if you do not have love for Him? And, and one of the amazing things about God also is the, the fact that he's told us, we look over in the book of 1 John, he, he's told us, I loved you first. I want you to love me back. You know, it's not a, you know, God sitting up in heaven saying, well, as soon as those, those uh, silly humans get their heads screwed on straight, maybe I'll go down and talk with them again. Boy, we'd be in trouble if God was sitting up there doing that, wouldn't we? Waiting for us to get things in order without the help of God, without Jesus coming to the earth. In Matthew 22, in verse 37, we see that uh, Jesus said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. 
You know, in 1 John 5, 1, whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone who loves him, who begot also love, or, or who, him who begot also loves him who is begotten of him. So, of course, as a disciple of Christ, one of the things we need to make sure that we are doing is we, we need to make sure we have love for God, love for Christ, love for his church. And the same, really, the same kind of love that we see Jesus offering. Jesus expressed the same thought as John here in, in John 15, 23. He who hates me hates my father also. Also, a disciple of, of Jesus is one who loves Jesus and loves God also the same. Now, uh, another thing that we see is we see that we need to have love for our brethren. We need to have love for the church. Those of us that are in the church, we need to make sure that we, we love one another. John 13, starting in verse 34, Jesus says, A new commandment that I give to you, that you love one another. And once again, Jesus says, love one another as I have loved you. You know, in 1 John chapter 1, or chapter 3, verse 14, John made it a sign of spiritual life. He says, we know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother abides in death. You know, obviously what John is referring to is he's, He's not saying that if you don't love your brother that you're going to be struck by lightning immediately in your life is going to come to an end. But he surely is talking about a spiritual death. Not being alive in the church. Not being alive with God in our, in our hearts. We also see in yeah, 1 John chapter 2, 9 through 11, he who says uh, he is in the light. I'm sorry, hold on. He who says he is in the light and hates his brother is in darkness until now. He who loves his brother abides in the light. You know, so here we see, once again, uh, using uh, different ways of, of taking things in, in life, you know, light and dark. You know, from the beginning of the world, it seems we have compared goodness to light and bad, bad things to the dark. But we know Jesus has used this example. We even, you know, sing a, a song usually during vacation Bible school that our kids often like. You know, that this little light of mine. You know, and the whole point of that song, even though it's, it's written to entertain kids, it really has a good meaning. You know, we're not going to hide it under a bushel. We're not going to hide the, the light that we have. We're not going to let Satan blow it out. You know, we're going to let it parade around the community and let them know that we are Christians. And one of the ways that our light is going to shine is through the love that we have. We also see in the scriptures that, you know, for instance, John 3.16, we see that it's, uh, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. We're to love the lost. We're to love those that do not know Christ. We're going to love those that even may stand in defiance to Christ. Because that's what God did. God first loved us. You know, it, it doesn't say in John 3.16, and I always like to play around with this verse. You know, for God to love the perfect humans that lived over in this one region of the earth. It doesn't say for God so loved humans until they became adults because... That's when they go wrong. It says, for God so loved the world. What is the world? The world is sin. Now we know that God does not love sin. God cannot abide in sin. But it's that statement that he loves us so much that he did not want us to abide in sin. He did not want us to live within the boundaries of sin. You know, we, we see in passages such as Matthew 9, 35 through 38, that Jesus likewise had compassion for the lost. It begins here in 35, then Jesus went about all the city and the villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he moved with compassion for them, because they were weary and scattered like sheep, 
having no shepherd. Yeah, you think about that. Everything that we are asked to do as a Christian, Jesus did first. And he even suffered upon the cross, the death, the, the crucifixion, that really today I have nothing in my life. It is as, bad, as many bad days as there have been in my life, and, and you know, there have been a lot of good days too. I'm not saying my life is doom and gloom. But if I calculated up all the bad things that happened in my life and all the complaining I did in my life, none of that would compare to what Jesus did upon the cross. None of that would compare to, let alone just take a leap, take a look at, at the last week of Jesus' life that we've been studying Sunday morning in our Bible class. And all the things that, you know what, as a human, we wouldn't have stood for. We wouldn't have stood in front of somebody and let them accuse us of doing something wrong without defending ourselves. But that wasn't what he was there for. We also know of the apostles. You know, Paul had great concern for the lost. Brethren, my heart, desire and prayers to God for Israel that they may be saved. Think about it. Here, here Paul is right in your own San Juan. I mean, Paul is talking about his own people. Biologically, his own people. The blood that flows in his body flows in those in Jerusalem that he was talking about that were lost. Why were they lost? They hadn't accepted Jesus. They hadn't accepted him. Now, that's not to say, that's not a blanket statement. Because, you know, Acts chapter 2. 3,000 souls were baptized. Another chapter or so ahead of that, 5,000 souls were baptized. You know, but it's the idea that just like anything else, last week we talked about the narrow way, the narrow path and the wide that Jesus talks about and how the path to heaven is going to be narrow where it's harder to get to. So that, thinking about 3,000 or 5,000 souls being baptized, that was a, a minute amount of people a minute amount of the Israelites, that is. You know, he also says in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, 19 through 22, I'm not going to read the, through this whole verse here, but for though I am free from all men, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win the more. And to the Jews, I became as a, a Jew, that I might win Jews, to those who are under the law as under the law that I might win those who are under the law, to those who are without law, as without law, not being without the law towards God, but under law towards Christ, that I might win those who are without the law. You know, in other words, Paul is saying that he tries to find some type of connection in each one of these groups of people. You know, obviously, he's not going to want to live outside of Christ so that he can convince someone else to become Christian. But he's, he's finding similarities. He's trying to find different ways that he can approach people because he wants them to be saved. So what we see here is a disciple of Jesus is one that loves those who are lost in sin. We love our God. We love our Savior. We love those that are lost in sin. We love the brethren. Now, one of the ways that we can demonstrate this love to God is through worship. You know, this is how we can best demonstrate our love to God. Assuming that our worship is in harmony with what Jesus revealed. You know, the idea of the spirit and the truth, as we see in John 4, 23 through 24. It includes keeping his commandments, as we see in John 14, verse 15, 21 and verse 23. And in verse 15, if you love me, Jesus speaking, keep my commandments. What does that mean? It means that if we love Jesus, we are going to be obedient to the gospel. We are going to be obedient to what Jesus has said. We're going to obedient, be obedient to the way that he lived his life. And we also see here in John 15, verse 10, that if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. 
Now, the Bible really kind of tells us two ways that we are to worship God. And the first one being in, in the public assembly, Hebrews 10, 24 through 25, that we need. It says, let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another. And so much the more as you do see the day, the day approaching. So we come together. You know, we, we don't have to worship Jesus. We don't have to worship God just on the first day of the week. We can sing praises to him during the week. We can pray to God. But this is talking about the assembly, gathering together with like-minded individuals. But speaking of worship outside of the assembly, you know, Matthew chapter, uh, chapter 6 and verse 6, yeah, it says, but you, when you pray, go into your room. And when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who is in a secret place. So the idea that as Christians, we need to make sure that our worship doesn't end when we leave these, these doors here. Remember, the church is not this building. The church is the members of the body of Christ. So therefore, we are members of the body of Christ, and we have love in our hearts for one another. We have love in our hearts for the lost. We have love in our hearts, especially for God and for Jesus. We can't signify the church as being a location here as this building. We need to realize that when I go home, when I get in my car tonight, when I go to work tomorrow, are we living up? Are we worshiping God in our lives? Praying to Him, reading Scripture, studying Through fellowship as well. This is how we can best demonstrate our love for our brother. So we demonstrate our love to God by worship. But we also know that if we're going to demonstrate our love to God, we need to make sure that we love one another, right? You know, going back once again, looking at Hebrews 10, 24, and verse 25, that passage there. I don't have it. We just read it, so it's not up there. But, uh, you know, the idea that not forsaking the assembly is what that passage said. You know, we are to have fellowship with one another in, in a couple of different ways. First off, by coming together as the church for the Lord's Supper and, and other means of edification, singing, praying, reading scripture. We see that in, in Acts 20, verse 7, that, you know, Paul, when he was, uh, was there, he, he actually held his trip up because the first day of the week was coming and he wanted to worship with the brethren. We also see in, in 1 Corinthians uh, 14 verse 26 it says, how is it then brethren whenever you come together each of you has a psalm, has a teaching has a tongue, has a revelation has an interpretation, let all things be done for edification. Another way that we show love for one another is by spending hospitality to one another. You know, 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 8 through 9. It says, And above all things, having have a fervent love for one another, for love will cover a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling. So we, we demonstrate love for one another by fellowshipping whether it is in worship, uh, as we have done today, this morning, and this evening. But we also demonstrate it in our homes and how we treat others, taking care of others, taking care of the brethren. We also throw, show the love that, that God wants us to show through evangelism. You know, there's no better way to show love for the lost than to take the Word of God to them. You know, last uh, last Thursday, you know, uh, I had a Bible study over at Alan Venetia's house. Uh, something that we had done in the past, and now we've started back up. And I had pulled in, and, and you know, there was somebody there that I had never seen before. It happened to be one of Alan's friends that just showed up. You know, and then we said, well, we're going to have a Bible study. Do you want to come in and join us? 
And at first his answer was, oh, no, 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 that's okay. And about halfway through the Bible study, he comes in, sits down, picks up the Bible, and actually started asking questions. And I just thought, wow, this is wonderful. You know, we hope that it goes further than that, but just the idea that we had an opportunity to teach somebody that was not necessarily someone that went to church on a regular basis, or someone that necessarily was looking for the gospel. In Matthew 9, in uh, Matthew 9, 35 through 36, we see by teaching the lost, that's one way that we, we show our love for the, the lost. Uh, Matthew 9, 37 through 38, we see by calling for prayer in behalf of the lost. And in Matthew 10, 1 through 5, and verse 7, by developing and sending forth laborers. You know, we, we can show our concern for the lost in this way through personal evangelism. In 1 Peter 3 and verse 15, it says, But then sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Always be ready to defend the gospel. Always be ready to teach the gospel. We also see something similar here in John 1, 45-46. Philip found Nathaniel and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law, and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathaniel said to him, Can anything, anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. Now think about that for a minute. Nazareth had a really bad reputation. There wasn't really anything good that you could look back on and say, hey, this strong leader of the Israelites came from this town, or, or this uh, judge, or this person that did this in the Old Testament, or anything that they could count. You know, I, I love what Philip said to him. He says, well, if you feel that way, and I'm paraphrasing here, because he just said, come and see. But you know, if, you, if you're thinking that, Come and check it out for yourself. You know, another way that we can support evangelism is through the evangelism of individuals that are in foreign soils. Romans 10, 14 through 15 says, How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. So the disciples demonstrate love for the lost by engaging in both local and foreign evangelism. Now, that's not to say that if you don't ever go to foreign soil and preach the gospel that you're failing somewhere, because there's plenty of people that are there that need support. And we can head out along the way. But there's also plenty around here in our communities, at our jobs, in our schools that can use the Lord, that can use Him in their lives to take their, their selves, themselves out of sin. You know, we go a long way to becoming true disciples of Jesus by loving the Lord, by loving the brethren, and by loving the lost. We go a long way in demonstrating such love through public worship and private devotion, fellowship with one another in both church and home, engaging in both local and foreign evangelism. Many Christians love only partially. Think about that. You know, I think every one of us probably at times have been caught up with, with maybe a bad taste in our mouth about someone and we may have said something that we shouldn't have, something that wasn't loving, something that wasn't caring. But think about what that means by partial love. Can you imagine if God was partial in his love? You know, if God went down a list and said, well... This is one of my good creations. This is one of my good creations. Let's cross Jason off the list. 
You know, can you imagine that? And that's why we are asked to do what he does. No matter how much we love as disciples of Christ, we can always improve. In love and compassion, we can always add more. So as I, I bring this lesson here this evening to a close, I offer the invitation here to you. Many of you have been studying the Word of God, you've come to that realization that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, the Anointed One, the Son of God that died upon the cross. We give you the opportunity this evening to be baptized with Christ, confessing Him as your Savior and having your sins washed away. Or maybe you're already a Christian. Maybe you're struggling, stumbling in some way, and you need encouragement. We ask that if you're here this evening and you have any need, that you come forward as we stand and sing this song.